when you look at the naked cowboy, it is a shame and a disgrace to see those people dancing around with this guy standing on back of the guitar as if he was naked with, with the cowboy boots and the hat on. And they think this is Christianity. With this True News video update, I'm Doc Burkhart. As if Hillsong's recent controversy regarding the Times Square naked cowboy wasn't creating enough worries for the megachurch, a further look at the video reveals even more startling content. This video shows a clip from Hillsong's recent color conference, a special event for women. This huge production number, which features the naked cowboy, ninja turtles, dancers, and other images from the Big Apple, finishes up with a crooner introducing Lady Liberty. Unfortunately, this Lady Liberty has a beard. What message is Hillsong trying to convey? If the purpose is to portray Jesus Christ as Lady Liberty, many Christians would find this extremely offensive because Lady Liberty herself, a gift from France, is actually the image of a goddess. And why have a man portray Lady Liberty at all? What purpose did it serve other than to convey a transsexual message of inclusion for the megachurch? The viewer is encouraged to watch the video and judge whether this portrayal of Jesus as Lady Liberty is glorifying to God or the very incarnation of apostate blasphemy. Uh, this is simply entertainment for the millennials. It is again something we've referred to. The prophecy of Charles Spurgeon over 100 years ago. A time would come when instead of having shepherds in the pulpit feeding the sheep, we would have clowns entertaining the goats. Well, Brian Houston is a clown. Bobby Houston is a clown. Carl Lentz is a clown. Clowns entertaining the goats. That's what it is. Spurgeon's prophecy has come true. It has been fulfilled. He was absolutely correct in what he predicted, and it is happening. It's unbelievable. What would the world think? What would unsaved people think looking at this ridiculous, absurd spectacle? Now, again, when you add this to the Australian Broadcasting Company or Corporation documentary exposés on the financial scandals at Hillsong. The Sydney church that's become a global phenomenon. <laughs> From cafe culture to concerts. People ask me, could you ever imagine all that was ahead of you? Born in Castle Hill, now Hillsong is about to become bigger than ever. Find out where their churches are setting up next in Sydney and around the world. Nine News tonight. And to the sex scandals with Frank Houston, with Pat Mercedes and so forth, and Bobby Houston. Christian women love sex. Now it's the naked cowboy. The whole thing is a shame and a disgrace. But co-equally shameful and disgraceful are people like Greg Laurie compromising with it, making excuses for it. There is no excuse for it, Greg Laurie, and there's no excuse for your making an excuse. You've done the same thing with Rick Warren, who says we have to unite with people who worship other gods. Other gods that Paul and Moses both called demons, Shadim and Damanoi. We have to unite with Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims to bring in global peace. That is the Antichrist agenda, and you wheel him out in Anaheim Stadium. From the Houstons, I expect this. The way you see God decides what you believe God does, what you believe God loves, and what you believe God blesses where his favor will be. So I couldn't encourage any leader who wants to live purposefully and who wants to build a church that reflects the heart of God. I couldn't encourage you more to make sure that your view of the master is through a new covenant, New Testament lens, that we look at the Old Testament, which is so full of beauty and power and example and wonder, and is so much of the whole tenor of God's message that we need to look at it through the lens of the resurrection and the cross and back into it from where we stand now and not from where they stood then, because otherwise it's gonna affect your ability to be purposeful and building and leading and bringing release and bringing freedom and seeing those things God puts in your heart come to pass. How do you view God in a desert? There's two types of birds. There's vultures and there's hummingbirds. One lives off dead carcasses, rotting meat. The other lives off the beautiful sweet nectar in a particular flower on a particular desert plant. 
In the same desert, they both find what they're looking for. Do you know, if you take it all the way back into the Old Testament and the Muslim and you, we actually serve the same God, Allah, to a Muslim, to us, our Father, God. And of course, through history, those views have changed greatly. Carl Lenz, I expect it. Be patient with each person. What? I didn't even know that was in there. That's annoying. Everybody? I'm going to check some commentary to make sure that doesn't mean everybody. Be attentive to individual needs. That's interesting. Isn't that cool? That's why some churches want us to give blanket answers on huge issues. Well, my Bible says be attentive to individual needs. That's why we're not going to make polarizing political statements about certain things in our Christian community right now. No matter who says what, we won't be pressured into giving blanket statements to individual needs. Never. <laughs> Never. Um, speaking of diversity, you know, New York City, one thing that is polarizing to some communities, especially within religion, is homosexuality and the yeah. debate around it. I mean, how do you balance those two things? I mean, are people of all sexual orientations welcome? And, and how do you see that? Absolutely. I think what I was referring to there was, you know, some people would be like, you need to make bet, you, you need to answer our questions about the homosexuality issue. And I always say, I do, you just don't like my answers. And here's exactly what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. The, some media wants us to use our pulpit mm -hmm. to uh, have a soapbox for social issues. I don't believe that's our job. I don't believe Jesus did that. You go look at what Jesus did. He was always talking about the heart of an individual and the soul of a person, not these symptomatic societal problems. And people hate that because a lot of churches are about what they're against. We're about what we're for. And when it comes to people's sexuality, I don't want to use a public forum to yeah. talk about private things because how in the world can you have a dialogue? How in the world can I hear your story? How in the world can someone have a question? So if I, if I stand up in a pulpit and I just start railing at something or make a statement in, in a newspaper about something, I, I believe it's insensitive to the journey that people are walking yeah. on and our church is going to protect people no matter where you're from, no matter what you carry, no matter what kind of um, orientation you feel like is your um, you know, lane of life to run in, um, you know, I want to have a conversation about it. We have a stance on love, yeah. and we have conversations about everything else. Well, I, I mean, I love that, and that makes sense to me, because when you say, you know, you have a stance on love, and you're talking about hearts and souls, I often see, you know, people want to focus on homosexuality and, and the gay marriage issue, and whether yeah. they should be allowed to get married, and a lot of homosexual couples are looking around saying, I just love this person with all my heart and soul, yeah. so I'm looking for some support. Yeah. Do you feel like it's, you're not in a position to give them support on that issue, or do you feel like it's just not your lane? It's not, I don't, it's not my job to be people's judge and jury. Yeah. If I sat down with a homosexual couple and they asked me what I thought about their relationship, I would tell them, mm -hmm. and it would be at their table, and it would be our business. But their situation is different than the next situation, and often people get these two words mixed up, mm -hmm. acceptance and approval. Like, I don't necessarily, if someone comes to my church, I don't have to approve of every single thing in their life because that's not my job. I'm not God. Yeah. But my job is to accept you as I have been accepted with everything in my life. God accepted me. So acceptance and approval, we draw a really cool line in there because it's like, look, I'm not going to tell you. There's a lot of people who will come into our church, uh -huh. leave and go, no thanks. I don't want to change my, I don't want to live, I don't want to believe that. And I say, good for you, that's your job. You have to answer to God for your life, not me. Yeah. So why is this on me? So right. people are always like, what do you think about homosexuality? I'm like, I love my wife, I'm married. You're asking the wrong guy. Um, but that's just to be funny. But I, I do believe it's such a, a sensitive issue. I have gay friends, yeah. I have uh, people that I love that are right in the thick of that kind of debate. Right. And I just refuse to uh, ostracize people any longer. I hate it. I think that there's been so much hate yeah. and so much bigotry and so much insensitivity that um, I'm done with that. And so the people who criticize us for it, yeah. I, li I like making those people mad because yeah. no, they, they are who they are. And I think if we focus on love, it'll all fix itself out. If, if all people just focus on love, I, I, at least that's my personal belief. Um, I do want to so you know before you go, yeah. before you, it, Jesus said to do two things. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then he said, number two, love your neighbor. From Rick Warren, I unfortunately expected. But from Greg Glory, I would have expected something better. But there is nothing better. Well, let's understand it even further. Carlins, and I state this publicly, and I state this to him, is a hypocrite, a false teacher, and a liar. He's a hypocrite, a false teacher 
and a liar. Taking a passage from Thessalonians out of context that we deal with people on an individual basis, he takes that to mean we do not deal with publicly moral issues that are controversial or that can be politically interpreted. He said that Jesus doesn't do that. It's not scriptural. He says he's not going to talk about same-sex marriage or homosexuality because it's a personal issue. He's not going to deal in a public forum like church with a personal issue. He's a liar and a deceiver. Romans 1 is not in his New Testament. Widespread homosexuality and bisexuality were endemic in the Greco-Roman world in the first century. We had people being saved out of that background coming into the body of Christ with serious questions concerning it. Writing under the direct influence and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul addresses those issues in Romans 1 and does so publicly. Carl Lynch, you're a liar and a deceiver. You and your naked cowboy. You are responsible for what happened. It was your church, your conference. Colorful. I'll debate you anytime, anywhere on these issues, Carl Lynch, because I know what you are. You're somebody who Jesus warned would come in the last days to deceive the elect. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.